Thank you, uh, Roy, for the um, kind introduction and for the invitation. Um, I was going to surprise people by telling them about my connection to 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 Waterloo, but yeah, no, not so many people know that I am. I, would, I spent some some of my time at Waterloo, and and I think some very important, you know, a very important time at at Waterloo. So I was going through. Um, um, slides, uh, my, my, my mailbox trying to find um, photos uh, from those days. It's, it's really hard to be, be associated with Keith Heipel and escape his camera, as some people might know. And, and somehow I've managed to do that. Uh, but instead, I, I found some, some of my final papers and assignment, um, and which made me think about um, what Waterloo played, uh, you know, the role Waterloo played in, in my future. Uh, these are like the final papers I submitted. Uh, to two of my co two courses I took at Waterloo when I was here with um, Don Byrne and, and, and Keith Eiffel. And what I've done later on is pretty much the same thing. Um, Waterloo, it got me exposed to game theory, and, and later on, I, you know, game theory became not only useful for me in, in, in research and teaching, um, but also in, in politics and negotiations, and more importantly, in detention and interrogation. So um, it was, uh, and, and 14 years now like has passed still since then, and I wanted to uh, share, I want to share with you what I've um, done during this time. And I thought Tona might, might look the, like, like this, because apparently I was negotiating with, with the department over taking a, an English test back then, <laughs> trying to argue that because I was studying in English in Sweden, I shouldn't take it. So, Pano, um, I think, yeah, March 14, 2005, you agreed that I don't take an exam, so I owe you $100 with, uh, with all the interest. Uh, so, so that requirement was waived for me. But um, 2017, I, I got a, a chance of, of going to Iran and, and serving in, in politics. Um, I'm not going to tell you my, my reasons for that, uh, for taking that decision, for making that decision. Uh, but but um, uh, when I, I did that, when I was considering this opportunity, I thought about pros and cons in all possible scenarios. And I thought I was not naive. And I still think I was in, in naive. But I, I, I could never imagine that uh, when I say yes to this opportunity, um, you know, and once I land in Taiwan, I get arrested up front at the airport before I start uh, my, my journey as, as a politician. But uh, this was an opportunity for me, another uh, lesson for me to realize how uh, complex the real world is, and a lot of times our calculations um, go wrong. In, uh, anyway, Iran has a, a complex political system. Um, I got freed up and, and then uh, worked for, for, for months with, with a great group of people who trusted me and, and wanted to do things. On the positive side, I think uh, you know, I had this opportunity to accomplish um, a lot and turn a lot of ideas that we learn or we discuss in, in scientific environment and academia uh, to, to real products uh, within the policy world. And this was golden. And I think this was one of the reasons that, uh, uh, for which I don't regret this, this, this thing. Uh, we accomplished a lot. We, we, we could, uh, I think, like there was a chance to leave a legacy, do some of the things. Uh, I heard today that there is a new ban on, on plastic uh, here uh, in, in Iran, I managed to ban plastic bottle waters uh, in, in, in the uh, Department of Environment, which was a the great victory back then. Uh, in, in, in negotiations, I led uh, the Iran delegation, COP negotiations. I know you, you, University of Waterloo had, had, had the delegation at COP23. That's where I was uh, trying to actually promote the role of water and, and remind people, all the negotiators, that water is an overlooked um, piece of the Paris Agreement. So there were also like these good opportunities um, to, to, to turn science into, into real products. But, but eventually, after things got really out of control, um, smear campaigns and interrogations and detention had become part of my, my life. But eventually, after the death, death of an Iranian Canadian professor and environmental activist and, and detention of some other, other people, I, I had to resign and, and leave Iran. Um, 
this was a roller coaster, definitely, and, and you know, so it was a tragic experience for me and my family. And you know, as we're speaking, probably some of you and the Iranians have seen um, the attacks today, uh, 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 like uh, on social media about me and Ahmad News and others have written. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, things are still continuing. But if I want to be selfish, I, I and I think want to think about the positive sides of this story. I think I can call it the best sabbatical that I, an academic could you know, wish for because um, I got exposed to you know, life threats that are serious, but in the meantime, realizing how, how serious things are, how different um, the real world problems are, how you know, some of the times we are uh, solving the wrong problem in academia. And I, I knew that uh, two plus two is not four, uh, but, but this was also a verification in the fleet that, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, perhaps when Aristotle said this, this meant a positive thing. And I think still it does mean a positive thing uh, when we talk about interdisciplinary science and bringing the bright minds together. But, but I, I mean it in, in a negative way in, you know, here. Uh, and I want to use it as a reminder to ourselves that that problem can get much more complex than what we think and and just simply focusing you know by focusing on parts of the bigger system well, there is no way we can understand the whole um, system and and um, even though we learned this quite early in 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 our um, education uh, we we keep ignoring it systematically somehow we ignore complexity we're not comfortable with complexity and that leads to a lot of problems and, and you know some of the examples that I'm going to walk you through um, so in, in you know as an example in, in fluid mechanics and physics we learned that water always goes from a higher elevation to a lower elevation right and and in economics we learned that we don't take um, decisions which are not um, economically justified. We are not going to, uh, if, if they're not cost effective, we don't do it. Combine politics with, with, the whole, with this recipe. You do things which are crazy. You move water around, you, you transfer water, you pump it uphill, and you violate physics laws, you vi violate economic laws. And this is something that we, we early on in our education, we learn and, and we see it in, in practice. But we systematically ignore this sort of complexity and we keep insisting are where you know our own comfort zones and staying in our own comfort zones and and trying to see the problems from our own lens um, that creates some sort of uh, wrong narratives wrong interpretations or you know uh, of, of real problems and misinformation one good example of of bad information and, and this sort of approach, reductionist linking to a complex problem is the Syrian crisis. Uh, linking the Syrian crisis to water and, and drought is, and, and saying that drought is the cause of the Syrian crisis, although it gets some attention for us as a water community and we get headlines and we get some attention, but, but, but you know, it, it is actually a reductionist thinking. It's ignoring uh, years of, like decades of institu institutional changes, uh, social destruction, bad decisions, and so on. But we tend to do that because some of these problems are very, very complex to understand. Now, uh, if I knew two plus two is not equal to five, or like you know can be can be five, now I think it it can be way way um, um, bigger than what I I perceived before serving in politics. Now let's let's get a little bit positive, uh, and I I want to remind you that. Uh, this is not a talk about, like, I don't want to disappoint you. I don't want to say that what we are using is useless and worthless. Instead, I'm trying to argue that we, we need to think twice. We need to be less arrogant. And we need to pay more attention to details and some of the things which, which matter. Now, we are in the fourth industrial revolution, right? We are going through this. Uh, a lot of we can innovate and invent at an unprecedented rate, very rapid, very fast, digitize everything, remotely sense um, things, measure, monitor, talk to users, collect citizens' information, run uh, big data, collect big data, run, uh, analyze, analyze big data, use machine learning, or artificial intelligence, and all these advancements that we have made, which is really helpful. And, and this is our fourth revolution, right? But, but, but you know, 
does this mean that we, we, are, we, we can also understand things better? If we have an increased computational capacity, if we can compute better, does it mean that we understand problems better or not? And, and then when we look back and, and consider what came with the previous revolutions, they're pretty scary. Any sort of invention, any sort of progress we made in the past have come with unintended consequences, which we are suffering from. And, and one problem is that these are like there is path dependency. So we, we would kind of depend on the decisions which haven't been made in the past. And some of those are irreversible. I mean, we can't see like how hard it is to kind of uh, separate uh, economies from, from oil and energy right now I'll make the decision making um, you know separate from energy and so on so any sort of decision making or any sort of revolution have, has come with this sort of um, unintended consequences now the question is whether we are acting differently or not and I think I, I like to argue that we are not actually uh, uh, thinking differently although uh, we have made a lot of progress although we are now, we, we have more access to data and computational, still the way we design and we solve problems is, is the same as before. So this has not changed. And uh, linear thinking, especially um, in engineering, what we learn and the way we, we try to solve problems is that we see a, we see a problem and we, we imagine our desired state or we want to go back to some sort of desired state. That defines our problem. For that, we come up with, with some sort of solution to alter the environment and we create our outcome. That's perfect, that's the way we have been solving problems and we're still solving problems despite all these innovations, resource depletions and all these problems that we, we have. Now, what, why does this cause a problem? Because we forget about any sort of feedback that can be created. Most of the times we cannot even imagine or, or find or guess some of the unintended consequences of our solution to the pro problem that we, we you know, uh, to, uh, to the problem, uh, solution to the problem we are trying to solve. So this sort of uh, feedbacks can create a, create a, a, a lot of additional problems. So you're trying to solve one problem and create an, you know, another problem. Now, uh, going into the uh, human water systems, whether you want to call it social hydrology, human water systems, human water system of systems, or whatever, I'd like to give you some examples of some of the work we have done this in this domain, and, and um, in my, some of my slides, I have uh, the you know, names of the people who have uh, collaborated with me in some, in some, of, some of these papers to give them um, credit. So one example, which uh, I think I'm, I'm also um, very proud of because it had a lot of impacts in, in real world policy making, is the example of, of, of using tra water transfer as a so solution um, to a water shortage problem. Um, the example I'm going to talk about is, is belongs to Iran, where I, I work. And later on, I, I worked at, on the um, committee which was making decisions for water allocation in this basin. But um, the, the example is, is from Iran, but this is, a pro this is a problem we have pretty much everywhere in the world. Like anywhere we have decided to transfer water, whether California, whether we are doing it in, in California, um, whether we are doing it in Brazil, China, um, the rest of the Middle East and so on. So um, Isfahan is a former capital of Iran. Zayan the Rud River Basin is, is the basin which houses Isfahan. Um, this, the river goes through the, the, the city. The identity of this um, beautiful city is, is tied to water. Um, and, 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 and then beside all that, it, it has a high population, you know, urban um, water demand. It has a, a strong, great uh, agricultural water demand, almost 90% of water goes into the agricultural sector, and it, it's an industrial basin in Iran. And on top of all these, there is a, a, a wetland in the basin, at the end of the basin, which is preserved on the Ramsar Convention. So that is the beautiful Zion de Rood. Fortunately, at this moment in time, there is some water flowing there after we got, have got like a lot of catastrophic flooding. In, in Iran, but, but most of the year, this is the scene. Uh, a river which, which, which is like, which, was, which brings joy to the uh, community, to the city, is dry most of the time. Imagine the UK London without Thames. Um, the identity of, of city ha has, has problems. So, so what they have done in this basin is, is water transfer. They have implemented a lot of water transfer projects in this basin. Still, 
they face water shortages. And they, they have almost like more than doubled the natural flow of the river through multiple water transfer projects. And they are planning on additional water transfer projects. And this continues going on. So how do they do it? So they have these like, you know, tunnels. They find another an, an an source of water. They, they plan for like inner basin water transfer. They cut the, the, the mountains and try to move, move water around and bring it to the central, um, this, this province in central Iran, which is politically also very powerful. So you have the agricultural land uh, you know, around the river, uh, very like, you know, heavy agriculture. It's, it's dry, and it's, 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 but, but still they, they grow rice, for example, in this region. And this is the wetland that I talked about uh, at the end of this basin. Now, as a result of all these things, you transfer water, you make people happy, but over time you create problems. This, this basin is, is suffering from a lot of tension. Tension over uh, water which is coming in. They also donate, you know, transfer a little bit of uh, what they get to other basins. Um, tensions over what is going out of the basin. Um, demonstrations, uh, strikes, and, and a few years ago we had even a, a, a situation where people got killed. Uh, explosions of, 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 of pipelines by, by the farmers. So you, they ha we have managed to, you know, or the Iranian decision makers have managed to create problems both at, at the donor basin and the recipient basin through water transfer, through a project, through a solution which was supposed to help the original problem. Now, uh, you know, some time ago I started modeling this system. Like any water engineer, I started with, with uh, coming out, you know, capturing the physical elements, surface water, groundwater, precipitation, and so on, to determine how much water supply I have. And needless to say, just so you know, um, I'm an engineer, so these are all like, they're all mathematical equations behind all these connections and, and loops that we are, you are seeing. But um, what, one thing which was, um, you know, uh, which I think was a game changer here is that when I did this model, so, so then you have your water supply, you want to calculate uh, how much of the water you allocate. Then you come to these boundary things like, um, or, or exogenous um, elements or variables like water demand. And, and here this was what I faced. Fortunately back then I, I didn't know um, a lot of, I mean, some of the methods that the economists use to, to calculate water demand. Uh, and and um, so I didn't go by the traditional supply demand curve, and, and plus this is like a heavily subsidized basin, so there is no real market there. So when we start, you know, looking at, at what drives water demand, I try to come up with, so, like, looking at what has changed in this basin. And I, I saw immigration, I saw a great population uh, growth, and when you compare Compare it with the neighboring basins, the population growth in this basin is different. So it means that development has had an effect on, the, on this basin. So, so again, coming to another, um, another uh, variable that we normally take as an exogenous factor being population growth. That's how we have been planning in, in, in water resources engineering. They give us a demand, they give us a scenario, and we plan for it. We never question why, you know, so, and it's always like business as usual, high, low, and, and these sorts of projections we, get, we need to get uh, ready for it. We never question why. Population growth, the same thing. We never ask why the population should grow this way or well, you know, how, how did you make that assumption or how did you come up with those scenarios. In this case, we try to come up with the dynamics of this, looking at the, the economic attractivity of the basin, looking at like, you know, how water shortage can play a role in, in reducing the attractivity of the basin. An early version of this model uh, didn't have a, um, a strong element on estimating agricultural water demand, but later on we added some sort of an agent-based um, element or module to calculate how, like, you know, the water demand, how farmers um, decide about what, what crop to grow depending on the signals they get from the market, the, the last prices. Now, this confusing thing, when I coupled it, it became a, this, this complex model. Can I present this to anyone? No. Uh, would, it get, would it be easy to understand? No. And, and you're not the only one who, uh, who might struggle reading through this. And, and that is why we, we needed to do other things, and I'm, I'm going to talk about it. But, but eventually, I had a dynamic model which has with all these feedback loops that I'm talking about, and now I'm going to run it. 
But like any model, this is like, you know, this model has limitations. So I only have to make sure that it, it behaves properly. You, you run it through some scenarios, some extreme cases, and you also like, you know, try to see how good um, the history of the basin is replicated by your model, like how it is simulated, like observed population data, observed, um, you know, rice land area in the basin and, and so on. So it, it, it behaves reasonably when I, I run it. Then the next thing is I run it through based on some scenarios. The scenarios are how much water comes into the basin through water transfer, how much, um, like, you know, what sort of interventions I use as a regulator to, to minimize groundwater withdrawal, to minimize surface water withdrawal, to cut water from the agricultural sector, to do this, to do that. And in all of these, you know, this is an speculate, like, you know, in mo a model like this, the best you can do is like to speculate about the future. It's not a, like a model used for prediction with like pre precise prediction. What we want to realize and what we want to learn through running this model over and over under different conditions is what sort of behavior do we see? What sort of overall behavior do we see? So out of, like, you know, the whole modeling practice resulted in this, this essentially stranger, like, you know, counterintuitive observation that if I add the water transfer uh, projects and, 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 and bring in more water without controlling water demand, what I see is that at the beginning there would be reduction in water shortage, but then water shortage immediately increase afterwards. This is exactly what we have seen in this basin in the past. Now, Again, I cannot take the, the, I couldn't take this to the public, I couldn't take it to the decision maker. What I tried to explain to the public and what I tried to take to the decision maker was, was this. So trying to come up with an explanation of this structure which drives, or the archetype which drives the behavior of this system. So what we are doing in this basin is we see water scarcity, that's the problem, and, and what do we do for it? What have engineers invented for dealing with water scarcity? Reservoirs, water transfer, you know, pumps, and, and all these technologies that we have. And perfect. I mean, we have to, we, in this case, inner basin water transfer. You can, you can replace it with anything else. So we in, try to increase the water supply and solve this problem. Done. That's what, we, we, you know, how we have been trained to make decisions. What we miss in this case is that increased water supply can lead to increased watershed development and, and migration and population growth and so on and expansion of agricultural land and as a result we have increased water demand. And when, we, when that happened, that, that actually makes, puts us in a worse position. There was a recent actually paper in, in Nature Sustainability that, that people saw, found also some evidence for what happens below reservoirs. When you, when you build reservoirs, water demand going up. And the same thing with, with water transfer, that um, when you n build a new thing, you create these um, you, you change the state of the system, you create human dependency, and the plans for development and everything changes. This is not to say that water transfer must not be done whatsoever. It is to say that this cannot be the full solution package, and if you implement it only on its own, then you can create other problems. What we call, in management science, we call this a fix that backfires archetype. Um, and it's about symptom management. You, uh, you, you try to fix the problem symptom and you forget the unintended consequence, right? Uh, problem symptom, you have a headache in your body, uh, you have a headache and you take a, um, you you a, a painkiller without knowing that you have infection in your body. So the problem symptom goes away, the pain goes away, after a few hours it comes back. You take another painkiller, the pain goes away. Infection keeps getting worse and worse. Your body needs antibiotic while you're taking um, painkillers. And that, that's, that's how your system or body can, can collapse. Now, do we have other examples? Tons of other examples, and this is something we're working on, to come up with the general archetypes or, or generic problems in the water sector, like you know, human water feedbacks, and how we have failed or keep failing by, by, by 
uh, cre creating some, some solutions, right? Uh, irrigation efficiency increase. That's another paradox. Is it good to ir increase irrigation efficiency if you have water shortage issues or not? Um, evidence shows that when you increase irrigation efficiency, you lose return flow and your farmers uh, start uh, using more water. This is, again, not to say that the irrigation efficiency increases bad, but if you implement it on its own, then you have other issues. You put pe people behind levees. You build levees and put pe people in floodplains. You make them vulnerable to any sort of uh, levee failure. So a lot of things, and they have been in the literature in different ways, like you know, safe government paradox, development paradox, and, and a lot of like you know these these examples. So this was just to argue that if if we want to solve these problems, the old, like you know we need to um, replace linear thinking with nonlinear thinking. We need to think about. Um, the unintended consequences and problem, and, and the feedback uh, uh, to our problem. Now, unintended consequences are unintended. They're supposed to be there. They're supposed to be unintended. And many times, you cannot predict or identify them. But if we think twice, if we think carefully, if we think about path dependency and try to implement solutions which are a little bit you know, reversible or give us um, the chance to adapt, then our situation would be different. So essentially, adding this element to our problem solving would change the way we think about uh, problem solving. And we understand in a, in a complex system, we are successful if our solution to one problem doesn't create problems in, in other sectors. And unfortunately, this is something that we are dealing with right now. Like we try to fix um, water shortage Problem: We create water, you know, food security threats. We might create um, job loss problems. We might create like you know dependency on other countries. We might we want to solve like you know a global warming problem. Then we, we might create additional footprints on, on some other resources. So that sort of thing is is still there. So in like there is a short editorial that like if if you. Um, Got a chance? You, you, you know, if you have time, you I recommend that you read is is about how how we you know some of the when you think this way how some of the terms that we are dealing with like you know resilience, sustainable development, sustainability, all these things become di you know have dynamic defi de definitions and are evolving concepts and uh, just simply monitoring like measuring them and calculating them can be very destructive and un unhealthy to us. Now. By this example that I gave you, I try to say that when you're dealing with a water problem, you're essentially dealing with a, a, a complex problem, a complex problem which has a lot of elements, physical elements, a, as well as human elements, you know, socioeconomic and so on, political and, 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 and so on. So, so, and this system, essentially, you know, any system which has nature and human together has some major characteristics. Bounded rationality. There is no way you can analyze and understand everything. Cause you know, inter the interrelated dynamics are there. Things are interrelated. These are, you know, they, there are causes and effects. Limited certainty, whether you call it deep uncertainty or whatever, um, they're there. Non-stationarity is there, and with humans, you have evolutionary behavior. All of these are not are telling us that we have to be careful with, with, with what we say about the future of these things and how we model it. But if, if I take this big thing um, and, and put it in the whole universe, that's my water sector. That's how small the water sector is in the larger universe, which is a complex human environment system or system of systems. In that system of systems, I have many other systems that are managed by different groups, and they have interrelated dynamics in, in, within themselves, but also are linked to my, my system. Like what? Um, I have the um, you know, water system, say food system, energy system, now environment system. But in addition to all these systems, I also have like you know, economy, job, health, infrastructure, defense, foreign policy, and all these things. Now, if I'm a politician, if I'm a decision maker, how do I span and or like decide about how to use my limited resources, limited, um, um, say, political resources, economic resources, to solve the most pressing problems that I need to deal with? And if if I'm dealing with the environment, if I'm dealing with with water, uh, how 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 important they are compared 
to some other matters, like jobs, like employment. I mean, if, if you uh, consider what Trump is doing, you can uh, find the, the answer to this, this question, the question. Now, in the public policy agenda, you know, one, one simple uh, rule that we can use, the Eisenhower box, is, is you know, looking at, this is a recent um, uh, commentary in Journal of Hydrology that I, I, I wrote. Um, it's about urgency and importance. The way you make decision is you go with this, like if you can turn the light off for a second. So this is address first, so importance and urgency. So you go with something which is both important and urgent. Now tell me how important water is and if it's urgent or not. I think water is standing somewhere here. Um, and you can turn the light on if you like. Uh, so water, it's, even its importance can be, relative importance can be argued when it's compared to other matters. Now for urgency, when you're talking about urgent, urgency, it's not as urgent as other matters unless and you know, in order to push it up there, you either have to get people very informed about the importance of and, and urgency of water, or you need extreme events. So unfortunately, in, in the water world, we, bec we, we remain very reactive. We don't implement reforms proactively. We don't, you know, so, so if you're smart, we, we use the extreme events in a positive way, but, but also in extreme event, justify some of the actions because they reduce the political cost of some reforms. So that is very sad, but that's a reality that we have to admit and, and understand and appreciate if you want to be successful. So with this understanding of, of you know, I think my career has, uh, to a good extent, has been devoted to, to understanding the community of, of, of modelers of, uh, and, and as well as um, the decision makers. And now, who is who? I'm not going to comment on it. But, but, but you know, so 2016 EGU, um, my metal lecture was about uh, uh, this. This is probably offensive, but I didn't mean to offend any 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 of the sides. But, but I was trying to say that this is the perspective we have toward each other. So, so um, policymakers think that university people and modelers don't have a good understanding of real world. They're emotional and so on with their stupid models and like you know mathematical exercises. And the other side uh, thinks the same way. We think they're irrational. They don't understand what is good. They don't understand you know maximizing social welfare and this and that. That. Um, so, so you know, with I, my I, my thinking is like how we can understand these two different perspectives and turn some of the solutions that we have into something useful and and, and practical, right? So this is the my situation in Iran that like some of my solutions was was crap, uh, were crap to to the uh, those who like the authorities, the intelligence authorities. But uh, but anyway, like how do you turn these things into useful things? Now, in my, my community, we, we had the tradition of maximizing social welfare, coming up with the social planner solution or the systems optimal or the Pareto optimal. Um, do, you, do you see any difference? So what, are the, what is the main difference between the red, red circle and, and the blue circle? OK, but, but then uh, another thing. Elevation is different, so I assume if elevation means something better, so 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 the red circle is is you know uh, more more desired or preferable, but but the difference is that I mean the other one might not be stable, and uh, um, a lot of my effort and, and time and research has been put into highlighting the difference between these two important things. Uh, optimal versus stable. What is practical and feasible and reachable from the situation that we are sitting in? The status quo. Right now we're here. I know we have to. We shouldn't have this president there and that politician there. And we have to do a better job with our social welfare, our insurance, our tax, this and that and that. But what is feasible? I argue that a lot of times we lose the opportunity of of using something stable, something which is increment, like incremental win, is that what you, you call them? So, so you know, it, small wins 
for the sake of because we're pushing so much for that big thing, for that ideal thing, for, for the whole world to get together and solve the global warming problem, for the whole world together to solve the immigration issues and, and get rid of all these problems which are there. And with, with a lot of people, I have had the pleasure of working over the years to ask if, if the solution that you have found on the paper, is it optimal? Is, is it stable, the optimal solution? Can you really implement it? Or you need to think about it and, and, and package it in a different way or frame it in a different way? How um, do we have any suboptimal uh, solution which is better than this situation, but is achievable? Like, you know, can we get there? And what does it take? What sort of mechanisms? And that's another thing which is missing from, I think, in, in a lot of research that we are doing. Pathway, like how do we get there? So I have identified that good point there, but I'm not talking about this pathway of how do we get there uh, in a realistic world. So now to get you, um, to give you an, an example of a real world example. So uh, we were asked by the Omani government to help them regulate um, their groundwater system. They have saltwater intrusion because they're pumping water in, in the coastal area. 8,000 for, and, and, and um, the solution, the smart solution over there was to use smart meters, smart water energy meter. They sit on the grid, they cannot manage, you know, they cannot interfere with them. You can remotely measure things. I can sit in Waterloo and measure like which farmer is, how much they're, they're pumping through like, you know, how much electricity they use. I can tell how much water they're using and then I can cut it remotely. I can do peak shaving, cut, cut it like during certain hours. So, so, okay, we calculated. It's hard because you have to uh, link your optimization hydroeconomic model with, with a, a, a groundwater model, a groundwater quality model, but eventually you find a way to optimize this system. So we do the calculation. We, we say which, which form should be pumping how much. So this is 8,000 forms. We turned it into 1,400 grids, and we did the calculation, even saying which forms, like what sort of crops, what sort of um, you know, summer crops and what sort of trees they, you know, they have to um, use and, and what, how much profit they make. And, and then, and then um, so, so that's, that's you know, pro profitability. And then how the front line or like you know, salt water intrusion can be controlled. And, and this was a planning horizon of like more than 100 years. And that's also a question there, like you know, how long should the, up, what the optimal horizon would be to plan into the future. What, what we did, what we struggled with, though, was, OK, now how do I implement it? I have the solution, but would the government of Oman, would the Sultan want to uh, make anyone mad? What, do, does he want to uh, make any changes? Like, or you know, would you rather, as a politician, to stick with, you know, to the status quo and eventually people, it's a coast, like people can sell their land and, and build villas and, and, and buildings and, and, and live a better life. Why would you want to interfere? with this system, and that's where we struggle, right? We have the technology, we can measure, we can monitor, but we can't implement because the institutions are, are not there. So one of the major problems we've had in the field, that's another thing that we, we have done and we still do, is you know we know that talking about governance, water governance, so we are dealing with a network of actors when we talk about water governance. Uh, but traditionally, when we have had multiple decision makers, we have converted our problem into multi-objective decision-making problem, multi-objective optimization problems. Now, if we were, an ec we were economists, we converted everything into monetary terms. If we were not economists, through playing with weights, we have tried to adjust that. What we do with this sort of action is the you know, assumption, a hidden assumption that Everyone is cooperative. Everyone wants to do a social welfare. And, and, and then we can say, yeah, we can compensate them and, and, and make it fair to them. And by doing this, we essentially put a social planner in charge of a system who would tell everyone to do what they're supposed to do. And, and all these people think that person is fair and they will obey and you know, they, you know, it knows what's it's in their best interest and they would follow that. So, so that's one of the major issues that we, we have in, in, in our literature of, of water, water resources systems. And uh, through different methods, we have tried to show how the willingness to cooperate can affect this and how the willingness to cooperate of the parties can hurt this, like, you know, can prevent um, us from reaching the optimal solution. And one good example of this is comparing social 
or the operations research multi-criteria assessment methods that are frequently used in the water resources literature for allocation of uh, for water allocation in, in, uh, in uh, for water allocation and compare them against some of the you know older um, give cooperative game theory methods that were used to measure uh, w weights of parties within coalitions and, and, and stability of different coalitions for cooperation. And when, you know, in this case, what we showed was that um, in, in this paper that what is actually the, be the best solution according to the operations research methods are the worst solution when, when they are um, when they're measured in terms of stability and, 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 and reachability. So, so that is a very interesting and, and I think um, counterintuitive observation and, and one reason for not making a lot of progress in, in, in many cases. Now, with this understanding, in, in my world, every, every person, whether a terrorist, um, a person who rescues other people's life, um, Trump or Ahmadinejad or Shab, they, they are rational. The point is that they have a utility function that I cannot understand. And every bad decision has a good reason that I need to go and, and, and figure out, right? So they know what they're doing. They know what they're trying to do. Uh, it's just us that we, like, you know, we get surprised with their actions because they think differently. They don't think about the long-term benefits. They don't like think about the cost they're having. Another, another issue that we, we have worked on and, and, and I think is another major issue in, in our uh, problem solving in, in human water uh, systems or in nature, human nature system of systems is that we keep talking about processes. Like I was a, nego like, I mean, I, I worked as a negotiator and, and um, uh, environmental diplomat. And taking photos and, and say ambitious things and, and, and you know, signing off the crazy things are easy. Uh, but no one talks in, in those meetings, no one talks about how do we get there. Uh, it's like, let's, let's solve the word problems, uh, words problems. And in many of the things we do in the literature, we talk about the processes, about like how fair things should be, what sort of indicators we should um, um, de use, or what are the targets, and so on. We don't, we rarely talk in the literature about the substance to trade. What should be traded? Who should be paying what to who? And if, if the substance is even there, can you solve the problem of global warming? The, 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 the global warming negotiations, climate change negotiations, got stuck for a good, good amount of time, and, and the positions of the countries have not changed. And when I was negotiating for Iran, I was also defending the rights of Iran and talking about the historical responsibility of, of other countries about you know, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So the, the positions are not there. What we are missing is the substance um, to trade. And, and this sort of focusing too much on indicators and, and processes and how to bring people into the room and, and, and talking about this can, can prevent um, us from reaching a solution. So that's another paper I did with an economist out of Calgary, he's retired now. Uh, but but on, on substance versus process in, in water negotiations. So the third issue is, is something I've, I've worked on, uh, which I call the strategic loss, it was a, um, and, and that is the issue of, of linkage. If we, you know, water problems are rarely about water, I think, in, in when it comes to negotiations. People have different sorts of utilities. Uh, when they want to block the negotiations, they keep talking about cubic meters and you know, cubic feet. Uh, but, but in reality, they have utilities that they, many times they don't reveal. So water is about other things. They have, it has different functions, food, um, job creation, environmental benefits, and so on. When you want to block it, you keep it in that, that, that space. In that space, in the water space, water negotiations, water games can be zero-sum games. Once you link them to other issues, then you create the opportunity for, for trading things, for losing in one game and winning in the overall linked game, because I'm dealing with you in t three, four different games. The reason that uh, US and uh, like you know, Canada can, can come up with, with some deals, or like US and Mexico can come up with some deals, or, and, and I, I think like North Korea and, and US might not come with deals, or Iran and North uh, US might not come with deals that easy, is that their, their interlinkage, like you know, how they're linked in different games are, are different. So, so through this sort of linkage, we can create opportunity for, 
four traits. And that's another thing that we need to discover. Now, we're good. We're talking about water, food, energy nexus, finally, and trying to think about these opportunities for traits. But we can definitely do more if we remember that our complex system has more components than water, food, than water, food energy. And, and the last point here is, is about the last issue, is about the evolving structure of, of environmental games. One, one problem that we have, both in the policy world as well as um, the, maybe the modeling community, is that we forget that the structure of some of these uh, games that we are playing are, are evolving. Uh, this, you know, there might be a situation, a crash situation very soon, 2050, 2100. But what we know is the pollution stock it keeps expanding and expanding. Greenhouse gas emissions, we're talking about water problems. And, and so tipping points is something that in many of our modeling approaches we miss. And, and, and you know, those, those tipping points matter to the politicians because if I know that soon I might have to chicken out, I might chicken out early. Um, and we, we, we showed the example of this in the California Delta problem um, a few years ago in, in 2012, that we showed how the California water transfer project started with something very cooperative and got into conflicts, got into the prisoner's dilemma, a state where like, you know, non-cooperation was, you know, was the best strategy, but now is getting close to the chicken state. And, and soon we have this uh, issue. And in, in 2013, I had this. This is by far the hardest paper I've written. Uh, the original paper was 17 pages. My response in the first review round, um, so 17 pages double space. My response to the reviewers in the first stage, stage of the review was 42 pages single space. Uh, and I was an engineer trying to criticize. Uh, and you know someone who was on, on you know on on the foreign it was a foreign policy advisor in the U.S. and I was advising that the U.S. should not be reducing carbon emissions essentially that because if the U.S. does so it's a strong signal to the rest of the world and 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 that so they would take the opportunity of free riding so so there is this issue of this guy if 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 this you know if we you need to chicken out soon you'd better think about it and this is something that we have not been able to provide that where do we hit the brick wall. When do the politicians hit the brick wall? If that, that state, that threat is there, things can be different. So at the end of the day, with all these complexities, what we need to care about, what we need to understand is how developing narrative, forming narratives can make a difference. What we tell the policymakers, what we tell the public, how do you define the problem? How do you talk about the, the uncertainties and complexities and, and so on? And how do you really have sympathy for the policymakers who are making tough decisions? What we are interested in most of the time is talking to the to the policymakers, not the public. Because we don't get that much credit to, for talking to the public, we get a lot of credit for talking to the policymakers. But this gap is strong, and it's there. That gap is meant to be there because scientists should be ahead of the society. But if the gap is too big, then we are not really impacting those who we, we should. And, and you know, then one, one important observation and one important point in the policy world is that even, even in, in, in systems which are, uh, I want to say, like not democratic, uh, politicians pay attention to the way public thinks. And if we don't change the mentality of the public, even if we don't inform them, if we don't change their expectations, there is no, there is no enough incentive. There are no incentives for the policymakers to make changes. And, and my take home messages are the four points. Two plus two can be five. If we want to solve one problem, we have to consider um, not, not creating new problems. Water is just a small part of the universe that we are dealing with. And we have to pay attention uh, to the difference between optimality and, and stability. And computation is not equivalent to understanding. Uh, we can be, you know, we don't have to lose hope, but we have to be realistic as well and, and not be ignorant to the problem. And last, not by, you know, last but not least, I want to thank all the students who um, in, you know, in, in the years that I've been in different places, I had a pleasure of working with, so most of the work are their, um, um, their work, and I have to credit them, and thank you.